So the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium was formed a couple of years ago, and its remit was to create an encyclopedia of mammalian gene function to begin to give the first comprehensive insight into the function of every gene in the mouse genome. And let, let me just remind you of this context again, because I think this is absolutely critical, uh, these few issues. We, the function of the majority of the genes in the mouse and human genomes is unknown. We know perhaps something of the function of maybe a third of the genes. So uh, the gap in our knowledge is extraordinary. You may think we do know a lot about every gene in the genome, but the, the fundamental answer is if you go to the databases, most of the genes, there's nothing really that we know about function. I think the other thing that's very important is that we're remarkably poor at predicting the functions of genes. We may say a gene is expressed in a particular tissue and it's likely to be important in that tissue. But we know from all of the genetics that have been done to date on mammalian systems that most genes have pleiotropic functions. They don't just function in one tissue or one organ. They have multiple functions. And we're very poor at predicting what those multiple functions might be and how genes work together within systems to influence the development and the function of different organ and, and cellular systems. As I've alluded to, knockouts have been generated and analyzed in only some 30% of mouse genes. And although we've got all that information, I'd just like to emphasize again, it's remarkably patchy. It entirely depends upon the interests and the expertise of the investigators who've looked at those knockouts. And by and large, they've looked at things that they're interested in rather than thinking, I should find out everything about what this gene does. And in some senses, you could say that is bad science. So there is a lot of bad science in the data basis of people looking at particular mutations and saying, well, I really only want to know what it's doing with this particular system, recognizing that we should really understand what the gene's doing in the whole organism. And indeed, those influences of that gene in the whole organism may be important for the particular organ system that you're interested in. So that's the context. And I think it's important to remember it as... Uh, uh, as as you hear, not only this talk, but the other talks. So the prelude to, um, and you're going to hear more about this from Wolfgang Wurst tomorrow, the prelude to doing the IMPC was the recognition that there was a project going on, the International Knockout Mouse Consortium, which began in 2004, a high-throughput international effort to produce knockouts for all mouse genes and to put these resources into the public domain. And indeed... Uh, it, this project started out to generate nearly 16,000 uh, knockouts across the whole genome, uh, half of them being generated through NIH funding in the States and half being generated by European funding uh, here in, in Europe. And this consortium, the IKMC, is approaching this target as we speak. There will still be a few thousand genes to be knocked out, uh, and uh, there are various projects ongoing to complete the effort. But what clearly we have is, um, I've showed you this slide before, what clearly we have through the IKMC is a huge fund of knockout embryonic stem cell lines which we can use to create the mice that are going into the IMPC for phenotyping. And Wolfgang Wurst, I'm sure, will tell you more about that tomorrow. Now, I showed you, again, I showed you this slide before. This is the IKMC allele here. It's known as a knockout first conditional ready allele. I'll say a little more about it now. I'm sure Wolfgang will say much more about it tomorrow. But basically, within the embryonic stem cell, we create this allele here. It's called TM1A. And basically, this is, if you like, a trapping mutation. Within the gene, the, the, this exon here splices into a LAC-Z reporter and effectively creates um, a truncated version of the gene. The other, the other parts of the construct has got a selectable marker, a neoselectable marker here, and it's also got various LOXP and FRIT sites. And this TM1A allele can be converted via CRE into this allele here, TM1B. This is a full null allele because it's deleted a particular exon within the gene, and it still retains the LAC-Z reporter. You can also turn this TM1A allele through flipping into 
a conditional ready allele. This is the TM1C allele. That conditional ready, conditional ready allele can be used with a Cree driver to create a conditional mutant, the TM1D uh, allele, using an appropriate Cree. Now, you can, Wolfgang will tell you more about this tomorrow, I'm sure. All of these allele structures were reported in a big nature paper from Scarns et al. in 2011. Now, it's important to note that in the IMPC project, it's this full null allele, the TM1B allele, that is being phenotyped. And it's also important to note that these mutants, as well as being nulls, have the ability to follow the expression of the gene through this LAC-Z reporter. The other important take-home point from this slide, and I'll just remind you again, is that all of these mutations were created in black 6N embryonic stem cells. But another important point in IMPC is that when we're generating the mutants from IMPC, we cross all of the, the chimeras that are generated from injection of these embryonic stem cells uh, into blastocysts. The chimeras are bred to black 6N. So everything is maintained on a pure isogenic black 6N background. So there are no genetic background effects in the phenotyping that we'll do in the future. So IMPC decided to use this particular resource in alleles to generate a mutant for every gene in the mouse genome, a full, full mutant, this TM1B allele, and to phenotype them. So that's basically the project. And this summarizes uh, what we're uh, already um, doing. As I've said, it's a broad-based primary phenotyping of 20,000 mutants from the IKMC resource. And clearly, as I've come on to state, this has got to be a coordinated effort of mouse clinics worldwide. There's no one clinic or one group of clinics that could do all of this work. And the work is being done in two phases. I'm going to tell you principally about phase one, which is already underway. It started in 2011. It's a phenotype up to 5,000 lines. And in, to some extent, this is a preparatory phase. It focuses on pipeline development and logistics, on phenotyping technology developments, for example, imaging. And the aim is to try and ramp up uh, to phase two, where over the course of five years in this 10-year project, we'll phenotype 15,000 mutants. So we have the genome fully covered. All of the data will be collected from the mouse clinics worldwide into a data coordination center. And that data coordination center will be responsible for QCing the data, for analyzing the data, and disseminating it worldwide. And I'll tell you more about that as we go on. So this is the structure of the um, uh, IMPC. And central to the structure are these production and phenotyping centers around the world. Each center is producing uh, some of these 20,000 knockout strains of mice. Each of the centers is operating a common phenotyping pipeline that I'll come and tell you a bit more about. It's also responsible for archiving and distributing uh, the mutant strains that are created. And there's one to two of these centers in each country. So these centralized production and phenotyping centers interact with the data coordination center, which is responsible for setting data quality control and standards, developing analysis and annotation tools, and disseminating the data out to the uh, international community. It's also important to note that the production and phenotyping centers are allied to specialist labs who will receive mice and mutants that have got interesting phenotypes, do additional phenotyping, uh, but we also get input from these labs in, into uh, the evolution and the development of the phenotyping pipelines. So that's the ba basic structure. And these are the centers worldwide that are involved in this project. Uh, you can go to www.mousephenotype.org to find out more. But you can see that the centers are distributed globally all the way from North America through Europe, to Asia and, and down to, to Australia. And overall, there are 22 academic and government institutes involved. Uh, there are 16, uh, 16 centers involved in actually doing the production and phenotyping as well as the informatics. These are the centers involved, as you can see, all the way from the UK to Italy to Korea. 
Uh, there's a secretariat which supports the activities. And then, of course, we've got key funders, the MRC in the UK, the NIH, who are funding about half of the current project in phase one. Welcome Trust are funding about a third. Infra Frontier, you'll hear more about this from Martin this afternoon. Genome Canada uh, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And when we launched the project in the autumn of 2011, these are all of the institutes who are immediately going to make a contribution in, in phase one. This is the total number of lines that they expected to contribute in phase one. As you can see, this adds up to a little more than 5,000, which of course is the target for um, uh, phase one of, of IMPC. So we're going to create these mutant lines. That's already underway. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. We're going to put them through a phenotyping pipeline. And this is the adult phenotyping pipeline uh, that uh, we're employing in, in IMPC. As before with Eumodic, we uh, look at fertility and viability. And you can see that there's an in-life adult phenotyping pipeline that goes from nine weeks through to 15 weeks. And you can see the various tests that are employed across that, um, the lifetime of the mouse. We do weight curves from four weeks to 16 weeks. You can see at nine weeks, we have uh, open field test, grip strength. We have a, a Sherpa and dysmorphology. We look at acoustic startle, energy expenditure through calorimetry, echo and ECG to look at cardiovascular function. Remember, cardiovascular function was the thing that we felt we weren't doing very well in Eumodic, and we've now put in additional high throughput test, so an echo ultrasound measurement of the, the heart, an electrocardiogram. We're introducing a lung function test, uh, a plethysmograph test, a, a glucose tolerance test for diabetes, x-ray, ABR for hearing, body composition, a DEXA test. Uh, we will probably introduce a pain test. As you can see, these are tests that are being developed or already been introduced, eye morphology, and then a variety, whole variety of terminal tests uh, once the mice have completed their 15 weeks. So expression studies on adult tissues uh, with LAC-Z to look at where the gene is expressed, hematological measurements, clinical blood chemistry, insulin blood levels, facts to look at um, uh, blood cell populations, uh, heart weight, and then where all of the centers are collecting and storing all of the tissue. Some centers are doing pathology on the mice, some not. But we will have collected and stored all of the tissues so that we can, if necessary, do block banking and histopathology uh, on any of the mice that, that are produced. So I think you can see from this that this has gone one step further than the Eumodic phenotyping pipeline. It's a better pipeline. Uh, I think it covers some of the gaps that were uh, not present in the emotic pipeline, uh, although I think it could still be improved further. If we look at the different areas that the tests cover, I've, I've looked at some of the systems areas, such as neurological and behavior, metabolism, cardiovascular, pulmonary, reproduction, sensory, musculoskeletal, immune function, and general uh, aspects of uh, phenotyping you can see that there's generally a reasonable spread of tests that are impacting upon those particular uh, disease areas. Although, for example, and to give you uh, a, a sense that this phenotyping pipeline is not perfect, if we look at immune function, I think most immunologists would say that this is not a terribly uh, good phenotyping uh, set of platforms because we don't do a challenge on the mice. We don't really challenge the mice to see their response uh, from the perspective of uh, immune function. So this is a step forward, I think, from Eumodic, but we regard this as a pipeline still in evolution that needs further improvement, and where I think uh, we'll continue to add some additional assays in. Now, you will remember that one of the things that we emphasized in Eumodic was the standardization of our protocols and operating procedures for each of the phenotyping tests. <coughs> And we've gone through exactly the same process in IMPC, to some extent building on what we'd already done in Eumodic. So in fact, we've gone back and minutely analyzed each of these protocols and the parameter outputs that we get from each of the protocols. 
And currently, for the main pipeline, we have most of the phenotyping protocols approved. Some are still in development, one's under consideration. Phenotyping is just beginning in IMPC, uh, so we're in good shape, but we really have reassessed the robustness and reproducibility of the phenotyping protocols uh, in IMPC, building on what we've already done in pneumonia. So as of March of this year, uh, this is the current state in our tracking system. Our tracking system for IMITs, I'll come back to this later, it, for IMPC is called IMITs. It tracks everything that's going on at all of the centers in terms of mouse production and phenotyping. And uh, this is a bit busy, but this shows you all of the centers who are currently uh, contributing mice to the program. Uh, Microinjections of, of the embryonic stem cells in, or aggregations into blastocysts. Mice that are genotype confirmed. Somebody asked a question previously in the previous talk about how do we check the mice? Well, we, we, we genotype them to make sure that they're the right thing. And then those mice, uh, once they're under breeding, they go into uh, an intent to phenotype status. And then, of course, as I indicated before, we've got to ex put the mice through Cree-excision to create the full null allele. So Cree-excision started, Cree-excision completed. The bottom line here is that we've, so far we've done nearly 3,000 genes have started the process of producing those mutant mice. And at the moment we have nearly 300 lines which are ready to go into phenotyping. In fact, at some of the centers like Harwell, for example, some of those mice are already in phenotyping. So in the first 18 months or so of the project, we've made great strides forward in meeting our target of 5,000 mice. Most of the mice will probably be generated over the next couple of years. Uh, and phenotyping, as I said, has already started. So we can meet our 2016 target of having 5,000 lines uh, phenotype. So IMPC is in good shape. We've, we've made progress. Just to summarize that, in year one, we did more than 2,000 uh, microinjections. But of course, we need to make this faster and cheaper all the time. And I won't go into this in detail, but just to say that there's an enormous R&D effort that goes on in parallel in these programs to try and improve our efficiencies of mouse production by looking at different aspects of uh, microinjections and so on. And indeed, of course, we'll be helped by the fact that um, here in Italy at CNR Monterotondo from later this year, next year, New centers are going to come online to um, contribute to the project, and there's another center in Prague that's also going to contribute to the project, 2014-2015. I want to come back to this issue that we don't stand still in phenotyping. We're focusing on validating new prop platforms. I talked about this. ECG and ECHO are already validated and are in the IMPC pipeline, as is the lung function uh, plethysmograph test. We're also looking at new imaging um, uh, modalities, so uh, optical, commuted, uh, com optical computed tomography uh, for looking at um, uh, eye phenotypes is, is being introduced across many of the centers. But we also recognize that there's still uh, some gaps in the pipeline that we're doing. And we need, particularly in neuromuscular and behavioral paradigms, to improve those gaps. One of them is motor function. Now, you'll remember in my previous talk that I talked a bit about the rotor rod test. The rotor rod test has um, a checkered history. It's used by a lot of institutions, people working on neurological mutants, to look at motor function. And you'll see many publications with the rotor rod test in. But it is highly variable. It has big variances. It's difficult uh, to pick out subtle motor uh, function uh, uh, abnormalities. And in fact, uh, when we were developing the IMPC pipeline, although it was in the Eumodic pipeline, it got thrown out of the IMPC pipeline. Some, some believe wrongly, but it's not in the IMPC pipeline. And we need to consider having something to replace it in IMPC pipeline. Another criticism of the IMPC pipeline is that we don't have a cognition test in. And we're also looking at potential cognition tests that should go in there. Because clearly, neurological and behavioral disease, particularly age-related disease, is an important part 
uh, of uh, the air disease areas that we want to target. So we need to do more here. And of course, improving uh, phenotyping will always come uh, by looking at further imaging modalities and also considering more how we introduce pathology uh, into uh, phenotyping. I know Paul uh, Schofield will talk more about that um, tomorrow. The other aspect of phenotyping is that we have a number of reference lines. Some of the mutants are going to be analyzed at all of the centers, so we get comparable data on how well the phenotyping pipelines are working across different institutions. Now, of course, uh, as was alluded to in the, uh, before in the questioning, uh, we have an adult pipeline, but we recognize that many of the homozygous mutants are going to be inviable. Uh, as was shown in Eumodic, uh, perhaps 35 to 40 percent of them. So we need to have uh, a pipeline for embryo phenotyping of embryonic lethals, and indeed that has been much discussed in IMPC and is now being introduced. And the main aim is to uh, assess homozyg to have a triage system, but to assess uh, embryonic lethals, first of all at E12.5, and to look at the expression of the gene at E12.5. And of course, if it's not viable at E12.5, we can go earlier to E9.5 and look at the mutation uh, at E9.5. Uh, if it is viable at E12.5, we can go out to 15.5 or 18.5 to look at uh, the uh, embryos at those particular stages. And by and large, the phenotyping at these different stages will be, do, will be done by imaging modalities. And that's uh, shown to some extent on, on this slide here. So we generate homozygotes just as we did for Eumodic by het-het intercrosses, generating homozygous cohorts which then go into the phenotyping pipeline. And where those homozygotes are, are inviable, and we need to look at embryonic lethals, as I said, the first step is to generate um, uh, uh, embryos at E12.5 and to look at them at that particular stage and also to capture the LACZ uh, expression data which tells us where the gene is, is, is expressed. We, and we'll really do two, two ways to look and capture uh, the anatomy of embryos at each particular stage. And that is either using micro-CT, which is generally used on older embryos, or optical projected tomography, OPT, uh, at uh, earlier stages. So if, the, um, if we don't see any embryos at E12.5, we go to 9.5, and we use optical projected tomography to capture the images of the embryo at that stage. If embryos are still viable at E12.5, we'll go out to E14.5 or later, and generally we'll use micro-CT to capture the anatomy of the embryos. So this is basically our phenotyping pipeline. It's been under consideration for a while. And if you go to the journal Disease Models and Mechanisms, there's now a couple of papers that report on the IMPC uh, deliberations on the embryonic phenotyping pipeline. And they'll tell you about what we've decided to do across the international consortium. So uh, we, we gather through anatomical imaging and LACZ expression, a considerable amount of data on embryonic phenotypes, where the gene is expressed, and what's going wrong anatomically with the embryos uh, that are, are dying in, in utero. So in IMPC, we have both now an embryonic and an adult phenotyping uh, screen which, which go together. So that's, that's the screen that's underway. Uh, clearly, of course, we need to capture the information uh, we need a whole slew of informatics support and informatics infrastructure that is being brought together under the auspices of this group, which is NIH funding called MPI2. And this is being done across a consortium of three laboratories, Harwell, Sanger, and EBI, who have all various different uh, roles uh, in managing the informatics of the project. Now, I know this is rather busy, but let, let me walk you through it. So basically, from the production and phenotyping centers, we need to capture all of the information that's going on in terms of the production of the mice and the phenotyping of the mice. We need to track 
all of the uh, uh, efforts that are being done, the genes that are being turned into mutants, the cohorts that are being produced, uh, the progress that's being made. We also need to store information on the SOPs, the procedures and the parameters. And as we capture phenotypic information, this all needs to go into the data coordination center, the Pheno DCC, which basically stages the data. At that point where we've captured the data, we QC it, we look at it, we make sure that it's correct, we validate it. And once we're satisfied with the quality of the data, it then goes into our central data archive, which is being held at the EBI. And that central data archive is the data set on which all of the annotation pipelines uh, will be operated. And it's those annotation pipelines that will tell us the phenotypes that are in our mice. And those phenotypes uh, are then ported out to uh, other databases or integrated with other data sets uh, across the world uh, where relevant. So this pipeline is, is, is now working. We have most of the components, and we're beginning to receive the first uh, phenotype data as we speak. Now, I should stress that this requires a lot of interface between the informatics team and the production and phenotyping centers. And this is done by a group of individuals who are called data wranglers. Their role is to wrangle, as it were, with the uh, production and phenotyping centers to sort out problems, to make sure that the data is flowing, as well as to develop the procedures in discussion with the production and phenotyping centers uh, on the IMPC informatics pipeline. So they're responsible for developing and, uh, the phenotyping procedures in discussion with the uh, phenotyping centers. They're responsible for looking at the export issues from the local limb systems within the uh, production and phenotyping centers to the Pheno DCC. They're also responsible for the analysis stages, the data quality control and the statistical analysis uh, that result before the data, uh, as it were, the Pheno map goes out to the wider community. So if you go to the IMPC site over the next couple of months, you'll actually begin to see some of the first phenotyping data that's coming out of the, uh, the IMPC uh, program. So the tracking and QC tools for data upload to the Pheno DCC are live, and we're actually receiving phenotype data as we speak. Some of the phenotyping data is coming in from the various centers. And we'll soon have a new gene details page live, which shows not only IMPC data, but all of the legacy uh, eumodic and uh, data from uh, other centers. Now, the question came up previously about QC, um, not only QCing that we've got the right mutant, but also QCing the phenotype data. And I don't want to get into the details of this, but QC of the phenotype data itself, have we got the, a, a, the, a realistic value? For example, take body weight. If you get a, a data point in the, in the data set that says we've got a, a, a mouse that weighs 200 grams, there's clearly something wrong with that. There's been a wrong data entry. Something's gone wrong. So we've developed quite sophisticated tools that both the data wranglers and the production and phenotyping centers can go and look at any procedure, any particular parameter, any particular mouse, and actually, through this user interface, look at the data for any particular data point, compare it to baseline data, compare it to control data, compare it to other data within the mutant cohort, and actually make the comparison and check, are we really getting good quality data coming through? So here we have, I think, a mouse that um, uh, we've chosen grip strength as a particular test, forelimb and, four and hind limb grip uh, as uh, the particular parameter that we're measuring. Here's the uh, individual mice that we're looking at the particular data point, data set that's highlighted against baseline and so on. So we have quite sophisticated tools to be able to really crunch through all of the raw primary data to check that indeed it makes sense before it goes through to uh, analysis and phenotype calls. So I... Um, do please go to the IMPC portal to find out more about the project. And you can search for your favorite gene and see what's happening to it. You can find out more about the phenotyping pipeline. You can find out more about the project status. 
Uh, and the sophistication of this site is, is increasing all the time to the point where you can not only access the raw data, but soon you'll be able to look at some of the phenotype cores for each of the genes. So um, before I go on to my last piece of my talk, I'd just like to recognize all of the centers and individuals that are involved with this project. The project has really taken off now, and this year you're really going to see the phenotype data coming through. So I think by the end of this year, we'll probably have the same amount of phenotype data that we had in the Umodic project, which took uh, five years in total. And after that, each year, you're going to perhaps see a 1,000 lines a year beginning to go into the uh, phenotype database. And of course, then we need to ramp it up into phase two uh, to actually achieve our target by 2021 of having generated mutants for 20,000 genes and phenotyped all of those mutants. So I just want to uh, finish off this story by a, a little vignette which came out of the Umodic project but is very important for IMPC and anybody who's thinking about mouse genetics and what we're doing. And that is to go back to this issue that all of the work in IMPC is being done on pure C C57 black 6 N strain, the N strain. So N is the strain of choice for the UCOM, COMP, and the IMPC effort. This is a novel strain. It hasn't been used much before in mouse genetics. And of course, the reason for choosing this strain is largely pragmatic because it turns out that C57 black 6 N ES cells are relatively easy to grow and manipulate, unlike black 6 J. However, J is widely used in mouse genetics. It's been incorporated into many genetic reference populations. There's a huge legacy, particularly of spontaneous mutations, that have arisen on J. So it's one of the major mouse inbred strains that have been used. And one of the questions has always been, and I think we've now answered this question, is what is the difference between N and J? What is the difference in terms of its genomes? And what is the difference in terms of its phenotypes? Are there really phen major phenotypic differences between J and N? So as part of the Umodic program, we undertook to, in the latter stages to undertake a comprehensive phenotypic and genomic analysis to identify the differences that underlie uh, the genetic mechanisms in these two strains. And uh, to, to some extent, because it's quite, quite a big project, um, I, I'm going to summarize briefly that the main take, take home points rather than tell you a lot about the details of how we got there. So the first thing is what, what's the difference between N and J in terms of genomic analysis? Because we have the sequence of both of these two strains. And, and in fact, we've got a better J reference sequence uh, from the Broad Institute in the United States than we have before. So this has allowed us to revisit uh, the genomic analysis, the genomic comparison of N and J. We've done a very detailed, highly validated comparison uh, of the genome sequences of these two strains to identify both SNPs, indels, and structural variants between the two strains. And we've had a particular focus on capturing and validating all of the changes between these two genomes that impact upon coding sequences. And I think we've captured them all with a very low false positive uh, uh, and false negative rate. So the, the, uh, the, the take home message is that there's not much variation as one would expect between these two substrains. There's 34 SNPs and two indels that distinguish N and J coding sequences. And there are 15 structural variants between the two strains that overlap a gene or somewhere in the neighborhood of a gene. So that's 51 changes between these two genomes in, in total. And we know exactly what those, 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 um, the, those changes are. So the question was, how phenotypically different are these two uh, strains? And the surprise is that they're very phenotypically different. And let me tell you a bit about what we've done. We, in fact, used the Empress Slim phenotyping pipeline and, this, uh, and all of the centers involved in Eumodic did a comparison of large cohorts of N and J. So we had a lot of robustness in our data by the fact that we could identify differences between the phenotypes of these two strains, which were replicated across multiple centers. 
Also, we had centers who performed additional secondary phenotype assessment to further explore some of the differences that we found in the primary assessment through the Empress Slim phenotyping pipeline. And as I've already alluded to, we uncovered significant phenotype differences between N and J, phenotype differences that were replicated across multiple centers. So this is a heat map. It just shows the direction of change between uh, N and J. Green is uh, one direction between N and J. Red is the other. These are the phenotypes that are replicated robustly across at least three centers. And I don't know whether you can read this uh, very well, but they cover a whole range of uh, different phenotypes from energy expenditure, blood pressure, glucose tolerance, uh, fat mass, locomotor activity, grip strength, rotor rod, I'll come back to this, acoustic startle, and clinical chemistry differences. So there are some quite significant, robust differences between these two strains, between uh, N and J. There are some phenotypes that are uh, replicated across at least two centers, which we're fairly convinced are real, but weren't necessarily replicated at all. In some cases, they're not replicated because uh, the test wasn't done at, at some of the centers, but these include areas, again, like DEXA, grip strength, acoustic startle, clinical chemistry, some hematological uh, parameters, uh, and so on. But let, let me take you back to one of the, uh, the, 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 the changes that we saw that were replicated across at least three centers, and that's uh, rotor rod. The latency to stay on the rotor rod uh, is very poor in the N strain compared to J. So N, N are, are uh, somebody characterized them, they're a bit lazy mice. They don't stay on the rotor rod. They, um, they tend to just fall off. J are, J are much better. Uh, and this was, of course, picked out in the primary screen that we did across all centers. But we've investigated this further. Uh, in fact, Sylvia... Mandillo at uh, Montretondo did the, these particular experiments. I just focus on this graph here. Uh, so she further explored this by looking at uh, rotor rod performance across four days. And you can see in black 6J, this is the top line, you can see that black 6J, they perform better right at the start. Their latency is significantly higher. But they, they train very well, and uh, the differences in latency are highly significant from black 6N who are rather lazy mice, they don't improve much, and they just tend to fall off the rotor rod. So this is a difference that we found in the primary screen that was validated by, by further experimentation. So we find a lot of interesting and significant differences. One of the questions is, do we find any inconsistencies, anything that we see big differences, but they're inconsistent between centers? So here's... Here's what I think is quite a beautiful result, actually, although you might think it's a bad result. But open field phenotypes were not replicated across centers. But it's very interesting because in two of the centers, ICS and Harwell, the data was relatively well replicated between the two centers. And we found that, as has been found by other experimenters, N mice, again, they're very lazy. They don't show many uh, center entries. Uh, they seem to be more anxious that, than black 6J mice. But look at the data from the Helmholtz. It's completely the opposite of what we found with uh, ICS and Harwell. And WITSI, uh, the Sanger Institute, didn't find anything at all. So this, in fact, is uh, this uh, data on open field uh, uh, is the... Is the only major test where we found an inconsistency between the two strains uh, across, uh, there are a few other minor tests which did show some inconsistencies. But this was a major inconsistency in the sense that two centers showed a clear difference, a difference that I should add has been replicated by other groups in independent institutions. One institution who had it the other way around and an institution that didn't find anything at all. What does this tell us about the difference in behavior, open field behavior between N and J? Well, I think it tells us there is a very significant difference. But there must be environmental or other impacts in the way that the tests are being done between these centers that are impacting upon both the direction of effect and whether you see an effect or not. 
And we don't have a clue what these impacts are. We've looked very hard between the testing procedures. Of course, we standardize them anyway, but we look for other things that maybe we didn't standardize that would be consistent with, this, uh, with these differences, and we can't find them. And I think, of course, that is a problem with behavioral testing. There will be environmental influences that will impinge upon these differences that we don't completely understand. But nevertheless, this does say that in terms of open field measurements, there are strong differences between N and J. So an interesting conundrum there that I'm sure will merit further discussion. So there are big phenotypic differences between these two strains. And the next question to ask is, can we relate those differences to any of the underlying genes that were changed in our genomic analysis? So in fact, we've identified all of, we identified the variant genes uh, that show uh, that we found between N and J that have got knockouts and where they had phenotype terms uh, which were being assessed in our eumodic pipeline. There are not so many of them actually. Uh, there's only about eight of them in total where we have either SNPs or structural variants between N and J where there are also knockouts in those particular genes and where they're assessed for the phenotypes that we tested in our phenotyping pipeline. But where we have that data, we can compare the knockout phenotypes to the phenotypes observed between N and J. And to cut a long story short, the green boxes indicate where we have a concordance in the phenotypes that have been observed in the knockouts between the, uh, and those phenotypes that we observed in the N versus J comparison. So there are a number of examples of concordance between the phenotyping changes observed in knockouts and the NJ differences. And of course, we'd expect that. The phenotypes must be arising from the genomic variation that we see between N and J. And we can now try and relate uh, that genomic variation in N and J with the phenotypes that we're seeing uh, between N and J. Of course, the, the interesting thing in all of this story is that we do see very significant phenotype differences between N and J but a relatively small number of genes change. The old, those 50 or so genes that are impacted between those two genomes must be responsible for all of these phenotypic differences in some way. So in summary, we found that there are significant phenotype differences between N and J in a variety of physiological, biochemical, and neurobehavioral systems. And we can be very confident about these phenotype differences they're replicated across multiple centers, apart from that open field test that I was talking about. And, then the, and therefore, they're relatively robust to environment. And therefore, we'd expect people would have to take this into account when they're thinking about comparing mutants that are developed on the N strain, as is happening in IMPC, and all of the legacy data or other mutants that we generated in the future on the J strain. So we have to think about that in terms of how we assess phenotypes when looking across different inbred strains. And it's an important lesson for mouse genetics generally. N and J are very close, and yet they have very big phenotypic differences. Those phenotype differences are going to impact upon how knockouts and the phenotypes that develop from those knockouts or other mutations in each of those two strains. And of course, those phenotype differences are likely to be accounted for, at least in part, by the 51 coding sequence variants identified between the two genomes. And there's obviously an opportunity to go back uh, and analyze in more detail the genetics between these two strains and see which phenotype differences are accounted for by which gene. Again, this comparison of phenotypes and genomes of the two strains was a big uh, multi-center European effort, and these are all of the, the people that were involved in, in generating that data. So... I bring you back to this uh, diagram again, uh, and I hope that I've I really illustrated to you that there, there is an enormous challenge here. I've, I've tried to bring out the fact that we're obviously generating multiple mutants. We have multiple tests. We need to think about the environmental impacts, not just the impacts upon our testing pipeline, but also the kind of environmental changes that we might make to elicit new phenotypes. And I've also talked about the issue, particularly focusing on N versus J, of the importance of genetic background and how that can fundamentally influence the kind of phenotypes that might be brought out in a particular mutant on a particular genetic background. 
So I think we are making progress with uh, our challenges. There's a, an awful lot to do, and uh, uh, I hope that I can come back to this course in a few years' time and tell you about the completion of phase one, because I think even when we uh, uh, get to the end of phase one, we estimate that in the IMPC database there'll be something of the order of 100 million raw phenotype data points. That's going to be a tremendous resource for the mouse community. We hope a robust and valid resource. I'm sure it will be. And it really will uh, uh, transform our ability to identify and understand the models and the genetic systems that, that underpin both uh, biology and disease. So I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you.